Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for the introduction just now. We are very excited to have this panel today on food sustainability, um, and I'd like to welcome our guests. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, so, yeah, per perhaps. Um, so I, my name is Luke. Uh, just a little background on me. Um, I'm a dual degree student at the University of Pennsylvania studying biology and finance. Um, and I just could possibly uh, you just give a brief introduction of yourselves, possibly starting with Heather. Sure. So I'm the founding general partner of Alwyn Capital. We're an early stage investment firm that's focused on changing the methods of production in society from inefficient and unsustainable to more efficient, more sustainable by replacing animals in the consumer supply chain. So we invest across food, fashion, and pharmaceuticals. So things like alternative proteins, either cultivated meat, fermentation-enabled technology, or plant-based foods, uh, replacements for leather or silk or wool, and then finally alternatives to animal testing. So we're laser focused on trying to create change through uh, capital marketplaces and create early stage companies. Thanks, Heather. And then Jose? Hi, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, great, to, uh, great to be here. My name is Jose Sill. I'm the CEO of, of Restaurant Brands International. We have uh, the, the honor and privilege of owning four amazing, iconic brands, Burger King, Tim Hortons, Popeyes, and most recently, Firehouse Subs. We, we have about 29,000 restaurants and growing uh, all around the world. We're in more than 110 countries and territories. And uh, I, I've been with the company for a long time, for about 22 years in a, in a number of different roles. Uh, we've, uh, we've been on a journey over the last several years to, uh, to build the most loved restaurant brands in the world. And, and doing that, the focus is uh, becoming brand-led, guest-centric. And, and this is what's led us down the path of uh, really understanding uh, the impact uh, that, that our business has uh, on, on the planet. Uh, and also in the communities uh, that, that we operate and we serve. And so that's what's led us to this, um, this uh, journey to, uh, to build Restaurant Brands for Good, our sustainability platform that, uh, that's really shaped uh, the way we think about uh, sustainability in our supply chain, sustainability in our restaurants, uh, sustainability in the communities in which we operate. And ultimately, uh, we think this is the, the best path uh, to build love brands because it's, it's not something we're doing for um, regulatory or public relations uh, reasons. We're doing it because our consumers care about it and we're doing it because our, uh, the folks that we're recruiting into our awesome company care about it. And, and, uh, and that's what's driving our energy and our enthusiasm and passion behind this important topic. Thank you for that. Uh, so perhaps just so people have an understanding of how you can get into this industry, the food industry, uh, <clears throat> Perhaps you could explain just a little of your background, how you got to where you are today, so people in the audience can understand how they too could get involved. Ha, uh, me? Well, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to- Jose, why don't you start this one? Yeah, yeah. all right, so I'll, I'm happy to tell you my, my journey. Uh, I, I went to law school. I went to uh, undergrad at Tulane and I studied history and political science. And then I went to law school at University of Pennsylvania uh, practice law uh, at a big law firm here in Miami for, for many years, for about almost seven years, and then joined Burger King in-house as a lawyer uh, back in 2000. And, uh, and early on, I uh, had an opportunity to work closely with the operations folks in, in the business there, supporting them. And, uh, and then an opportunity arose at some point to shift into the, the operations side of the business, uh, leave my, you know, hang up my legal cleats, if you will, and, uh, and, and get to work in operations, and that led me on a, an incredible journey to the international business. I lived in Spain for, for a while with my family, running the Burger King business out there. Uh, came back, I ran company operations, uh, so the stores that we own and operate here in the US. Uh, then I left briefly for about uh, 11 months to Walmart and then returned when the company was acquired uh, by a, a, a big private equity firm, uh, 3G Capital, back in 2010. And went back to Europe, to Switzerland, uh, ran the business out there for a while, and then came back to run Burger King globally. And then since 2019, I've had the honor and privilege of being the, the CEO of the, of the entire company. So it's been a, a, a pretty exciting and an interesting journey that uh, uh, those of you that are out there getting ready for, to, to get out into to the working world, you'll be, you'll be offered choices and decisions uh, or forks in the road, if you will, from time to time. 
um, you'll, you won't know it at the time, but uh, some of those are going to be some really important decisions you make in, in your uh, careers. And uh, I've been fortunate to have a few options and alternatives over time. And, and it feels like I've made the right decisions. Uh, either way, I went all in all the time, uh, put everything I had into it and, uh, and enjoyed it as much as I could along the way. And, and I've been very fortunate to have a, a great uh, run as a, as a result with great mentors and coaches uh, that have helped me along the way. Jose, you transitioned from being a lawyer to running operations at a food in uh, basically conglomerate. I mean, did, were you always interested in the food system? Um, not really. Um, my dad was in the restaurant. My dad was in the restaurant space. Uh, so he was um, uh, he started as an hourly employee back in the 60s here in Miami when he came from Cuba. And um, and then over time, he became a, a general manager of, this, of the restaurant, uh, and then he became a district manager, and then he had more responsibility um, uh, across multiple uh, jurisdictions. So I saw him do this, and I, as a kid, I remember going to restaurants with him. He'd, he'd actually leave me in one of the restaurants and, and go to the other uh, restaurants to talk to the teams. And I loved the environment. I loved the, uh, the camaraderie, the teamwork, the, the fact that the manager and the assistant managers and the and the line cooks, as well as the, the waitresses, had to work together to, to deliver uh, a great experience. And I, I grew up playing sports, so the idea uh, of being part of a team and, and working together, you know, high energy, uh, that, was, that was very alluring to me. I, I didn't understand the nuances and details of it until, until I got to Burger King and started to get into, into that sort of day-to-day uh, uh, -day and, and then figuring out that I could use some of my um, skills or, you know, both people skills as well as things I've learned uh, throughout the problem solving, et cetera, to be able to drive uh, business performance through people. Um, so I, I didn't really know I wanted to be in the restaurant space, but I did know that I wanted to be in a business or in a group where I can work together with people, use um, uh, you know the, the ability to connect and relationships to drive uh, positive outcomes for whatever it is we were working on. That's cool. It's it's interesting to me because it seems like most of the people that I meet that work in the food system are they started passionate about food. They came either through, you know, culinary or um, through operations and they're just they're really passionate about it from day one. So mm -hmm. it's cool to hear that you have sort of a, a roundabout way of getting in like I do. So <laughs> it's, it's good to hear that I'm not alone. Yeah, um, I started actually I was uh, biochemist. I got a degree in biochemistry from the University of Florida and started out as a research scientist working on pharmaceuticals in the lab. I realized pretty quickly early on, um, and I should have known this from the very start, but that I wasn't going to get anywhere without a willingness to test on animals. And at that time in my life, um, you know, I was a, an animal rights activist. I really felt strongly about the sentience of animals, and I couldn't figure out a way to to move forward with that career path and also feel like I was being true to myself. So I shifted gears. I moved to New York and got a scholarship to go to get a degree in photography and visual communication and spent over a decade in the fashion industry, building brands and narratives and helping young brands kind of communicate with consumers and still tell their narrative story. And then I got involved in public, public market investing and realized that all of my animal advocacy had a way to actually change capital markets. And so starting to understand the food system and early stage investing felt like the right path forward. And so got involved as an angel investor early on. And then in 2018, I brought on my partner and we formed All One Capital and we've been investing in this space ever since. So also sort of a roundabout way, probably a little bit different than Jose's experience, but <laughs> we, get, we get to the end point nonetheless and we're passionate about what we do. Yeah, and I think that's a it's a great story and a great lesson for everyone or all the folks that are out there thinking about what you want to do. I think the, the most important thing is to is to follow um, what you're passionate about and and then whatever you do, go all in. Um, you know, put all your energy and uh, enthusiasm and hard work into it. None of these paths happen by by chance or by by good luck. There is there is luck that that you create. You create by working hard. You create by dedicating yourself by putting in the extra hours. Um, that's what makes a difference over time, consistently working hard and delivering uh, good results. And, and that will lead you to the path that, uh, that you want to get on. It's not, I didn't come in or, or Heather didn't come in to, to, to lead 
or co-found a um, you know a fund that's dedicated to the business she's dedicated to. It, it, it happened over time through a bunch of uh, hard work and, uh, and and good relationships, and it's the same for for uh, me and others that have you know done things like like we have. Thank you for that. And I think I think that's that's so relevant too. I mean, just as a student myself, uh, it's it can be very scary going into a career and not knowing where you're going to go. Um, and it's very reassuring too to hear how people you might start one place and think you're on one path, and then it just you end up somewhere totally different. So and it, it can be really useful to bring yeah. expertise from a different sector to bring kind of like fresh ideas into a very established system. So I think that bringing you know. Education is never wasted. Anything that I used in biochemistry, I'm able to use in due diligence now with companies that are, uh, you know, leveraging biotechnology to create food products. And I'm sure Jose, you probably feel the same about your background as in, in, you know, legal. So yeah. it's, you know, just because you start out one one way, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the path you've carved for the rest mm -hmm. of your life. And to Jose's point, like for any of the students here that are considering a career in either impact or in food sustainability. There are lots of different ways to get there, but if you stay true to what your passions are, you'll find a way in the end. That's right. Great. And so for those of us not familiar with food sustainability, could you discuss uh, some of the current challenges in the space and some initiatives that are currently in place to achieve greater sustainability? Jose, do you mind if I start this one? Fire away. <laughs> So this is, forgive me if I'm on a little bit of a soapbox, um, and I'm sure that, you know, RBI and Jose have a, a broader view of the SDGs, but at All One, we're laser focused on creating sustainability through transitioning away from the use of animals. So if you think about our current population, right, we just hit 8 billion people, and for a little bit of perspective, in the 1930s, we had 2 billion people on the face of the planet. By 2050, we're slated to have 10 billion. And that means within the next 40 years, we have to produce more food than we have in the last 8,000. But with half of all the habitable land already being used for agriculture and 77% of that devoted to raising animals for food, it's pretty clear that we can't go on with how we're currently producing food in our system and remain in the status quo. And so we certainly, we, we feel like there's a transition that's that's ripe for, the, for disruption here because we can't nourish a growing global population with an agricultural system that uses too much land, too much water, and is emitting one third of global greenhouse gases. And Jose famously said that, you know, Burger King is all in on plant-based, which was super exciting for us in the early stage investing space. Um, but I don't, I don't want to bore you with a bunch of statistics about, you know, the, the science behind climate change. If you're interested, I can drop my email in the chat. I'm happy to send you all the studies. Um, but meat and dairy in our, in, you know, in the way that it's produced now is incredibly resource intensive and it's not terribly efficient. There's 25 calories of inputs that are used to create just one calorie of beef. So you can think of, of that a little bit like throwing 24 plates of food away for every one that we actually consume. And we believe that there really has to be a better way. And at Allwim, we're committed to finding better options to feed the planet. So we invest in companies that are creating alternatives to animal-based meat and dairy through leveraging plants, microorganisms, and biotechnology. And the same, those are the same technologies that are currently being used to create things that you're probably very familiar with, like vanilla or insulin and beer. And we really think that this disruption of the food system not only offers us a way to meet the Paris climate goals and create a healthier planet, but it's good business. So that's kind of where we're at from, you know, sustainability, sustainability standpoint. And you know, Jose, you probably have a much broader view on the whole food industry, but that's our take. Yeah, that's, look, that's, that's great. And I think, um, you know, it, because of work of folks like Heather, um, we've been able to uh, continue on our journey to, to build love restaurant brands. And, and so the, uh, from our perspective, from my perspective, it, it's, it's slightly different. Um, our, our main goal here is to is to feed uh, people, and so so people eat. Uh, you know, there's 30 or so um, meals that that folks enjoy uh, every week. So we're we're in a in a battle for share of stomach, and and the reason when people have asked me the question about plant based, I've said, look, we're we're all in because people are all in, consumers are all in, um, and so the it's and it's a growing uh, category. So it's an opportunity for us. 
to be able to serve great tasting food to our guests and and provide a a, a very uh, you know exciting or wonderful experience. You know, we, we can, we're in fast food, we're in quick service, so we we were with people for three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, typically maximum. I mean, some folks will hang around for a while uh, and have a meal and a coffee and maybe a dessert as well. That we we love those uh, guests, but uh, but it's not the typical transaction. So. Our uh, focus is on providing uh, great experiences to, to consumers and providing the foods that they want, the beverages that they want. Uh, and so that's what's led us to this journey um, uh, down the path of, uh, of plant-based. And, and it's why we think it's, a, it's an important part of, of the offerings that we provide to, uh, uh, to consumers here in the US, in Canada, and, uh, and all, all around the world. I think a, a little bit kind of more, more broadly, uh, as we look at sustainability as a company, you know, we, we obviously, um, to Heather's point, we, one of our biggest, uh, products, product offerings for Burger King is, is the Whopper. It's, it's our beef burgers. Um, and we know, uh, that there is an opportunity to, to have an impact on the planet, uh, on, on, on the emissions. Uh, so we've made a, a commitment on achieving 2030 and 2050 climate targets. Uh, and, and one of the biggest challenges is going to be, uh, addressing, the, the beef supply chain. And, and frankly, uh, there's not an easy solution out there. Uh, plant-based uh, is you know, one alternative, uh, but it's not the only one. And, and we don't believe that consumers are gonna be shifting completely out of, um, uh, of uh, animal protein uh, beef products. So we need to take the steps as well uh, to find a solution uh, for, for uh, global greenhouse uh, emissions uh, from the, the beef supplies. And it's something we've, uh, we're working with suppliers, we're working uh, with other uh, experts to be able to to move forward and do things that will help address that that issue. Um, another, uh, we, we've got four brands. Uh, Burger King. Uh, the big priority there is is figuring out the, the beef supply chain. With um, with Tim Hortons, our coffee uh, brand, uh, single use packaging is a is a big um, big challenge, right? Because when you go to a, one of our uh, concepts, and it's the same for anybody who's who's doing high frequency, high volume. Um, coffee, which is multiple transactions a, a day. In many cases, the same consumer will come multiple times and they'll buy a paper cup, which they use uh, for, for the one transaction or for the one product, and then they throw it away. And we're, we're trying to find a solution. We've challenged ourselves to find a solution uh, to reduce that in a, in a significant way in, in the coming years. Not easy uh, because people like their, um, they're kind of, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of stuck in their uh, in the past in terms of behaviors uh, that, that we've created. And so we're trying to find solutions uh, that would uh, mitigate the, uh, the impact on, on the planet uh, from single use packaging. And, and then the, the, kind of the final uh, area that I've been focused on is trying to find a way um, to, to address the challenges that we, that we all face. Uh, through industry collaboration. It's not normal or typical in our industry. We're highly competitive. And, and so finding a way to move forward and impact uh, our supply chain uh, through collaboration, uh, I, I call it uh, pre-competitive collab collaboration uh, with folks that are in the same uh, space as we are uh, coming together uh, to, to address the challenges alongside our, our, our supplier network uh, is, a, is a big opportunity. It's not... Um, intuitive and straightforward, but I think it's one of the keys to unlock the, the potential that we all have as an industry to be able to, to move in a direction that, uh, that is both um, consumer focused and uh, planet friendly. Thank, thank you. I think that makes a lot of sense too. I mean, it, it, there's just, there's so much to tackle in this space and it, it really seems like you, know, you can approach it in so many different ways. Um, so it's interesting to hear multiple perspectives on this. Um, so in terms of in terms of the in terms of the policies right now in place, could you speak to the the government? We we talked prior to this call uh, in terms of the governmental policies in place that are affecting food sustainability in the U.S. versus other areas of the world. Uh, could you just speak to that um, in some capacity? Yeah, I, I can jump in here uh, quickly, Heather. Um... I think one of the challenges that, that uh, we all face in the industry is that um, it, it, government is, has been a bit, um, maybe in some cases, a bit slow to address uh, some of these topics. And, and in fact, we, I mentioned earlier that we operate in about 110, 115 countries and territories all around the world. 
and it's it's different in most places. Uh, so uh, in Europe, where it's the EU in particular is probably the most advanced in terms of uh, addressing uh, these some of these challenges or topics that we're talking about here on sustainability um, in, in the food industry. And uh, and then I'd say U.S. and and uh, and Asia are behind. Canada is a little closer to uh, to where uh, we are in, in the EU, and and so the challenge for us um, is is it's hard to build uh, a global supply chain or a global game plan when it varies so significantly by um, by jurisdiction, uh, and and frankly, I think what happens um, where you see the biggest impact. In, in topics like this one that are important to to the planet is that is that when business gets behind it uh, when when um, for-profit enterprises get behind uh, important initiatives it usually happens faster than than if the government uh, tries to get there through regulation we would we always appreciate consistency and we always follow whatever the the, the government regulations are in, in whatever jurisdiction but I think to move faster and 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 move uh, uh, more quickly to where we need to get to as a as a as a community globally, uh, it's really up to to business to uh, to be able to to get there uh, at the pace we need to get there. And I also think that different different countries have different concerns from when you start to talk about you know food regulation, right? So we've seen um, Singapore, for example, uh, clear cultivated meat in a hybrid form to be released for open market consumption. And part of the reason that they're doing that is because they have, they have concerns about food security. And that is one of the, the driving forces behind their food regulation rules. A place like, uh, you know, to your point, like the US and Canada don't have the same sorts of food security issues. But if you read the news last week, we're very excited. The FDA approved our portfolio company, Upside Foods, to... Uh, sell their products to for human consumption and they've also approved their processes so that's a big win from the u.s standpoint and we actually to be honest with you i thought it was going to take longer than it did and the fda approved last week we're really excited about it so we've seen you know sort of like marching little little steps forward towards a, a bigger change globally um but especially in asia you know the growing population there will have to be changes there that will be made and a lot. Some of the companies that originally had started in other places had moved to Singapore in order to leverage the fact that their regulations were more open to allowing biotech in food systems. You know, I mean, that's why Just Foods had had moved to Singapore to release their good food chicken as a hybrid product there first. But you know, I mean, thinking about you know to, to Jose's point, kind of about the EU moving forward, the Danish government approved a climate agreement that included nearly $200 million um, invested into growing plant-based foods. And the Dutch parliament also approved cultivated meat testing. So we're seeing steps forward across the globe. And I think it just depends on, you know, from, from the government, what country you're looking at, it depends on why the regulation is being pushed forward, be it food sustainability, be it climate change, be it food security. And it just, it kind of depends. So you have to think about, when you're talking about government regulation in this space, you have to think about, you know, why why governments are are seeing those steps forward and how we as a very early stage investment industry can leverage those changes and, and push our companies in the right direction. Uh, and then also it seems sort of interesting too, um, across different areas, right? I mean, Jose, right, you're 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 uh, the different restaurants are in so many different countries. And then Heather, I'm sure also with investments, you have to look at investments in other countries as well. How do you manage all these different sets of policy? It just seems like so much to manage. How, how do you, how do you go about doing that? Well, in our case, we've got, um, there's a number of things that, that, that goes into the, uh, the, the consideration set. One is we've, we've got teams at the brand level uh, all around the world. Uh, so, so we don't manage it. Uh, from one spot, we uh, we have uh, some global leadership and responsibilities um, that we can that are kind of brand agnostic that we can have centralized. But but it's really in a business like this, um, which which has uh, global reach but but lo local uh, impact, you, you need to have uh, brand leadership uh, and management 
at, at the market level. And so we have offices in various places around the world, in, in Asia Pacific, in, uh, in Singapore, in, in Switzerland. Uh, we have folks uh, in Canada, obviously, uh, which is our worldwide headquarters, uh, also the headquarters for, for Tim Hortons. And, uh, and then we have folks in, in, uh, in Miami, which is where I'm at today. Um, and those uh, folks have responsibility uh, to manage the brand and the teams in those markets. And so they're, part of their responsibility is to understand uh, what the requirements are, what the regulations are, but, but more importantly, what the consumer uh, trends are, and where, where do consumers think uh, things should be heading uh, and how they view our brands in terms of that journey. Uh, and so we can make adjustments uh, and we can make uh, progress in terms of providing the consumers or our guests what it is that they're, they're looking for. And so having local uh, management or management in, in, you know, in, the, in the various jurisdictions is really important. The other is that we have, we're essentially a, a franchise business. We're about you know, 99.5% franchise. We have a handful of restaurants that we own and operate, but the balance are owned and operated by by franchisees in some cases in, in the US and Canada that there's smaller uh, franchisees. We have some very large franchisees as well. And then internationally, we have uh, what we refer to as master franchisees who have responsibility for the entire market. Um, and so in addition to us having management teams, we also have master franchisees or franchisees that understand the local uh, requirements and, and that the combination of those two things uh, it uh, gives us a lot of, uh, of, of opportunity to adjust and, and adapt uh, to what's needed at the local level. And then the third piece is that we have on the food side in particular, we have a supply chain that uh, is, is not uh, a single supply chain, but it's, it's quite uh, varied. And so we have um, multiple suppliers, we have multiple distribution points. Uh, all of that allows us to to adjust and to flex and to be able to provide to the consumer, to the end user, the consumer, uh, the products they're looking for, the quality that they're looking for. And, and in cases like uh, plant-based, uh, we've been able to, to make a pivot, a hard pivot. We're the, the, the leader globally in the, in the restaurant space on plant-based. And, and it's because we've been able to find really good uh, partners uh, in the US and Canada, as well as uh, internationally to develop products that taste great uh, and and also allow us to uh, to move into this plant based category. So we are a much smaller team. <laughs> we we don't have representatives all over the globe, um, but we do have co investors who have specific knowledge, you know, of certain uh, geographic regions. So we leverage those relationships. But one thing is that. Um, you know, as, as I was kind of talking about before, thinking about where regulations have been changed. So, for example, like in cultivated meat, helping companies think through their strategy, because we're looking for global change on a large scale. We're not looking for specifically local change. And like, yes, of course, you know, lo uh, food is a local issue, but it's also a global issue. And so thinking, thinking through where companies start and start to prove out their target market, prove out that they can execute on delivering something that's delicious, convenient, and at the right price point to a large number of consumers and then expand from there is really key. And it doesn't necessarily matter to us whether they start you know, in the US, in Canada, in the EU, or in Asia, it, it kind of all, as long as they're, they're targeting the correct consumer at that place and they can speak that consumer's language and figure out what works and what doesn't and then expand from there, you know, if they've got a good business model, they're investable. So from us, like we're a global firm, we invest, we've invested across Asia, uh, the EU and North America. We're still looking for, you know, a few investments in, in Latin America, but up, up until this point, like we've seen, we see opportunity everywhere and you just kind of have to think about the investment implications on our, our end. We have to think about, you know, our shareholders and how we're going to be taxing them once we have an exit event. Fantastic. Um, so just switching gears a little bit, uh, often critics of the food of food sustainability will cite higher costs for sustainability. So how do you offset this and balance sustainability and also profitability? You, so we you really go, feel you want to fire away. Sure. <laughs> so I mean, we really feel strongly, you know, that profitability and sustainability can go hand in hand. I mean, plant, the plant-based food sector was seeing exponential growth until last year when we saw flat sales across the sector as a whole. And that could be for a number of reasons, but 
honestly, in my opinion, I think where we felt short was, um, and we didn't see the large scale repeat buys was on taste. But that was plant-based 1.0, and that includes some of the offerings that are currently on the market, you know, which are all great products. But now we're seeing new innovations in, in the marketplace, like hybrid products, whole cut technologies, and flavor encapsulation that will give consumers that sensory experience of eating meat. So alternative protein is here to stay. And we are seeing innovation from young companies that are working on what we term plant-based 2.0 using things like fermentation enabled technology and cultivated meat to create new and better products for the consumer to meet them where they are and where their expectations are. And we've already seen buy-in from the meat industry. I mean, all five of the largest global meat producers have plant-based offerings on their product lines and four out of the five of them are invested in cultivated meat. So we think that this is the way forward. And rather than thinking about, you know, meat versus alternatives, we want to think, we want to be thinking in the future that this is going to be the protein industry. So, if we create ways to create a more sustainable protein for humanity to eat, then the profits are there. We're going to convert the masses. Yeah, look, I, I, I think very well said, Heather. Um, it, it, for us, we're, we're essentially, a, as I said earlier, a, a, a franchise business, 100% franchised. And their, their success is a key priority for us. So they, if they win, we win. If they don't, we don't. And so simple as that and uh, and very synergistic uh, relationship and and I, I don't frankly think that profitability and sustainability are are incompatible. I think I think they need to go hand in hand. Um, and and profitability in our business uh, at the restaurant level and and then ultimately for our company is an is an output. The inputs are um, having. Uh, great guest experiences and 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 creating brands that uh, consumers love. Uh, all around the world in markets uh, where we're in today, you know, 100 plus countries and territories. Uh, and, and that happens through great food. It happens through great uh, digital experiences. It happens through great service at the restaurants. Um, it happens because you have good looking restaurants that people want to uh, spend time in. Um, and it's also important uh, as you think about the restaurant space that people need to trust the, the experiences, the quality of the food. Um, they also care about the impact that you have, uh, some people care about the, the impact that you have on the planet, uh, the, the, the ingredients that go into the food that we serve, and what do we do uh, about communities uh, where we live and, and, and we operate. And so fr from our vantage point, this is a natural um, part of uh, bringing to consumers and bringing to our guests what it is that they're looking for. And, and so the challenge that we faced uh, with, with uh, plant-based in particular is that the the product that the product has evolved incredibly as, as Heather mentioned over the last you know five six years and, and over the last decade we've had we had a, a veggie product on the menu of Burger King for for years it was a morning star uh, product uh, or morning side product um, from Kellogg nobody bought it. Um, it, it it sat on the menu for a long time we had it as the kind of a veto choice um, you know to, to avoid that veto vote of if you're in a, in a group of people coming to the restaurant and, and somebody doesn't want to eat meat or chicken, um, beef or chicken, they, then we, we, you, know, you didn't have a real choice. Um, so we kept it on there, but no one bought it. And it wasn't because of uh, lack of, uh, of a consumer base. Uh, it was because it wasn't really that, that good. Uh, it wasn't that tasty. And so what, what's happened over the last five, six years is that the, the plant-based offerings have gotten much better. The, the, the quality is, is much improved. And that's what drives um, the growth in the category. The challenge has been is that I think some of the, the early stage um, success in plant-based in recent years uh, has, has come from uh, a view that this, there's a, a particular uh, technology uh, involved in the product. And so the pricing for that product has been out of sorts. It, to me, it doesn't make any sense for a plant-based product to be more expensive than a animal-based product. It shouldn't be. Um, and so pricing and uh, you know, those sorts of things are gonna have to come in line. Where we've had a lot of success is that there's been a lot of, uh, of, of really good work on the, on the costing side in Europe uh, with our plant-based products. And we're able to offer that product at the same price uh, as either uh, a beef product or a chicken product. It's, and we have, uh, in many markets, we have 
the opportunity or we offer the the, the choice to the consumer to make it plant-based so if you if you like the whopper you want to make it plant-based just ask for it you like a double cheeseburger but you want to make it plant-based you can ask for it and there's no difference in cost uh, for the consumer and there's no difference in cost for the franchisee i think over time there should be even more progress made on on the pricing side which i think will will reflect the reality of of cost between plant-based and, and animal protein. And I think that will then start driving uh, some additional growth in, in the category for both for us and I think also for the for retail and, and other players in the, in the space. So Jose, I actually have a follow-up uh, question for you on that. So we, I had a discussion, um, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago in Toronto talking to a couple of, to a bunch of different people that are in the plant-based food sector. And one of the questions was, what is going to drive adoption? And so you just mentioned, you know, bringing costs down and in Europe that you're able to offer the same offering, uh, either plant-based or conventional meat and allow the consumers to choose. Do you think that, that creating price parity across the industry is enough to drive conversion? Or do you feel like we still have innovation to make on taste and texture? Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a couple, there's a few things that drive, that will drive growth in the category. The first is taste. For sure, um, and and the imp improvements in taste are are critical here. I think the 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 challenge on that front uh, is is the second piece, which I think is important, and that's the the ingredients, the ingredient declaration of these of the products. Right, in order to, to achieve uh, taste, in many cases, in in, I, in what you call plant based 1.0, I think the ingredient uh, list included a lot of sodium, right? So, so the ingredient list and the and the nutritional value of uh, of some of the plant based products wasn't that materially better than animal protein. And so, um, I, I think there's there's a there's a very big taste component. There's a very big uh, ingredient uh, evolution uh, as well. Uh, um, and, and then I think price uh, is a is a is a key. Uh, player as well. So when you when you're able to have a, a really good product that's clean and straightforward from an ingredient standpoint and well priced, I think it'll allow for for more people to uh, uh, to to uh, kind of expand and, and explore uh, this category. The fourth component, if you allow me to add a fourth one, is that I think I think uh, whether it's the brands themselves or the or the producers of, of these um, plant based products or uh, restaurant brands like like ours, like Burger King, uh, who who has the product in, in multiple markets around the world, we have to figure out uh, how to communicate uh, with insight what it is that we're offering, right? Um, so, do people care about the health benefits of the product? Do people care about the environmental uh, benefits of the product? Do people not really care about either? They just like variety and choice. Um, like, what is it that's going to drive? Uh, trial and what is it that's going to drive frequency and, and and how you communicate that is really important and i i think we've we've made a, a lot of progress internationally on make on how to communicate that i think in in the us and canada we're still trying to figure it out because i don't think we have a good handle yet on on what uh people care about most here in uh, on, on those types of products yeah and that's you know interesting because it seems like by and large people in north america make a plant-based choice for health reasons right but in Europe, it's also for sustainability or for climate choices. And I think we'll probably see more of that in Europe, especially with the new labeling yep. protocols that are going to come out, mm -hmm. right? That they're kind of labeling according to climate impact for on food, food items at, on the retail level. I don't know how that's going to be handled in food service. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to see just like, you know, from your perspective, you're essentially a food service industry, right? And so you're seeing consumers in uh, a setting where they don't necessarily have the luxury of turning over a retail label and reading what the ingredient is, but yet that's still top of mind for your consumers. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, think, I think in Europe, um, as, as I've, I think there was, some, uh, there was a video that, uh, that I shared earlier or talked about some of the work that we did in, in, in some of our markets internationally. Uh, we, we made a lot of progress uh, by, uh, by Evolving the product uh, tremendously, how we message the product, and giving people choices on how to how to uh, you know make it their way. Uh, essentially, at Burger King, right? It's it's been one of our kind of uh, 
brand equities for for nearly 50 years uh, have it your way and and you know what better way to have it your way than to make it plant-based or or uh, you know versus uh animal protein uh but but we've we've been kind of surprised by how um advanced consumers are in terms of uh, making decisions and what goes into their consideration set but but it also makes sense Heather, you know when you look at what's available to people how much information people have at their disposal with you know access to to the internet and different websites people are much more informed today than they were five years ago and the choices that they make uh on on where they eat the brands that they um you know give their money to is uh it's is i think they're making those decisions uh, on on a much broader uh and and detailed set of of uh of facts and, and circumstances than maybe they did five or ten years ago totally agree So with our remaining uh, five minutes or so, um, first, I just want to thank both of you. This has been a tremendous panel. It's been really great to hear your thoughts. Uh, and just, I wanted to do one, one parting question, um, just looking towards the future. So perhaps you could just say what, what your hopes are for the future with sustainability and maybe where you see things maybe in 10 to 15 years down the line. I have one, one dream to see a cultivated beef burger on the menu at Burger King. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for that day to come before 10 or 15 years. Um, but as far as like innovation in the space, definitely uh, we're seeing new texturization innovation that's gonna offer alternatives to high moisture extrusion. So moving away from some of the standard practices that are used to create plant-based offerings, I think are gonna be key in meeting consumers at, you know, where they expect taste and sensory experience to be delivered. And then we're also seeing, you know, raw ingredient optimization start to come to be a conversation in the plant-based movement. So we're excited to see kind of in it where that ends up, you know, from thinking about it from farm to fork, how can we optimize food to that are that is plant-based to feed humans and not to feed livestock that then humans eat. And then again, just to, you know, Jose's point about we're we're seeing a lot of attention paid, especially by the younger generation to align their values with choices that they make in both, you know, restaurant or retail as far as food goes. So a move towards cleaner ingredient, more transparency in supply chain, and just, you know, above board practices by the food industry as a whole. So that's what, that's what we're excited about. And that's what we kind of, we see as the transition moving forward. That's awesome. Uh, look, from, from our vantage point and from mine in particular, we, I, I've been, Kind of on a on a journey uh, leading the company to to get to a point where we've uh, we've built the most loved restaurant brands in the world. We we've got amazing brands uh, all all around the world. We've got an opportunity to uh, uh, to serve guests uh, in in various places. We're you know we're one of the fastest growing restaurant companies in the world. To do that to achieve this dream, we need to uh, get closer to our guests. We need to uh, be much uh, closer to our franchise partners and, and allow them. To be successful by providing them uh, great plans, great support, um, great products, so they can serve the guest, and uh, and it becomes a very virtuous cycle that way. And and in that regard, uh, we think one of the the key priorities for the company is is to have a viewpoint on sustainability, um, to have a viewpoint on the planet, to have a viewpoint on the food that we serve, to have a viewpoint on the communities that that we uh, live and work at uh, every day. Uh, and that viewpoint has been is is shared in our restaurant brands for good. Uh, kind of framework that we that we communicate in our website uh, and update on a regular basis, and that and that informs our plan uh, to to make an impact on on this planet uh, over the long haul. So we're committed uh, to to building love brands, and to do so, we need to do the right thing uh, on the planet, and and that's why we've made the commitments that we've made uh, uh, for for 2030 and 2050, and that's why uh, I'm so passionate about uh, this uh, category of plant based. I think it's a it's an opportunity. For us to, to to do right by the customer uh, and also right by the planet. Thank you so much for your commitment to sustainability and bettering the planet around us. And it's been a really great time talking to both of you. Uh, and I'm sure our audience really appreciated your time and um, just going out of your way to making such a tremendous effort to to really better our audience's knowledge about food sustainability. It's been a pleasure to be here. Jose, it was great to talk to you. Great to meet you. Uh, Luke, thank you so much for the opportunity. Heather and Luke, I enjoyed it. Thanks so much. And I uh, hope everyone has a great, uh, great rest of the day.
Thank you.